coming up on Theater Talk. Jefferson, you're a, a, a theatrical personality on stage and off. Were you always theatrical when you were a kid growing up? Well, perhaps I was. I, I didn't. I, I, I lived in a neighborhood devoid of other children. So uh, <laughs> I come home from school and essentially put on last year's Halloween costume and and stagger around the yard mumbling to myself. Why were there no, <laughs> were there no children in the yard? You'd killed them all. I like killed them all. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Oh, I don't understand the poor. No, oh, I don't understand the poor. The lives they lead of want and need, and I should think it would be a bore. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So Michael, a big success of the Broadway season is this mad and murderous Broadway musical, <laughs> A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Which our friend Charles Isherwood of the New York Times praised. I think it's his favorite musical of the season. It's based on the, the oddest title novel, Israel Rank by Roy Horniman, which is better known to people as the Kind Hearts and Coronets film that featured Alec Guinness back in the 50s. And now it's been brought to a musical stage by the director, Darko Trezhnik, our guest. Did you get the name right, Darko? Did I get it right? Beautifully. Thank you very much. <laughs> much better than I'm used to. <laughs> and he's brought two stars of the musical, Jefferson Mays. Welcome back, Jefferson. You were here when you did I Am My Own Wife, yes. your Tony Award and every other award-winning play. and. Bryce Pinkham, who is the murderer of A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Darko, what inspired you to take on this crazy murder plot and make it into well, a musical? Well, three different actors, friends, told me about this wonderful musical, and uh, they felt that I was right for it. And then my agent did the same thing. And then um, I... Um, I directed a production of The Women uh, at the Old Globe, which is, I think, one of the best things I've done. Um, and Robert Friedman, who is one of the co-authors, he and Stephen Lutback wrote Gentleman's Guide, he came to see it, and I think he felt that there was a right balance of seduction and subversion. You were right for a musical about a man who murders all of his relatives to sure, get Sure, that's what attracted me to it. Because <laughs> I think, you know, everybody was worried about that initially. I mean, who's going to follow the story? And I thought, well, musical audiences love success stories, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> you know, Eliza Doolittle, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. So I thought, like, they're going to go for this as long as he's good at it. And if the actor who gets reincarnated eight times, each murder is a reward because he comes back, Jefferson in another role. So, right. Yes, and um, you told me it yeah. was your inspiration to bring in Jefferson to, pay, to play the eight murdered people. Sure. Well, the, the, the authors asked me, you know, who I thought should play the part, and we had worked together, and I had just read... In you didn't think Ethan Hawke? No, no, I did not. <laughs> I don't know the gentleman, but I heard that. Uh, but I heard that Jefferson had just uh, done on of the I Sing. Was yes, that of it? the I Sing with at the uh, yeah. at encores, and I was like, he sings because we worked together at Williamstown Theater Festival mm -hmm. in '99, and it was a great experience. We did a production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, mm -hmm. and I was like, it's Jefferson Mays, you know, and they were like, does he sing? And I was like, yeah, he does. And I told them about encores, and then you met with Steve. Yes, and yes, it was, it, was a, a, it was sort of, it was an audition, I think, sort of cloaked as a meeting. Yeah. Uh, said, well, that's, I, that's what you do, you're cloaked as a meeting. I go through these tunes, <laughs> you come along. Would you like to sing? It's yes, like, and I <laughs> managed to be vaguely. When, when people have Tonys, you cloak it as a meeting. Right, <laughs> yes, it was, it, was, it was painless. You know, but you, yeah. when, you, when you have these meetings, Jefferson, you, you have to remember, you've got to bring your Tony to the meeting. And when yes. they ask you, though, know, can yeah. you sing, you just put your Tony on top of the piano, so then it evens right. up. Right, yes, on a coaster. Mm -hmm. See, Bryce, these are the tricks. Right? <laughs> yes, yeah, good, good. But I think it does take a... Yugoslavian to direct an English musical written by two Americans. <laughs> <laughs> you're now you're playing eight characters. You're the eight members of the family. Yes. Bryce's character is bump, bumping off. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which Alec Guinness played famously mm -hmm. in the movie. Did you take any any of your lead or your inspiration at all from Alec Guinness? I assume. I take all my inspiration from Alec. Yeah, you can't go whenever, whenever that, possible. <laughs> but I remember seeing the film Kind Hearts and Coronets when I was about ten years old. Um, through a haze of pot smoke at my brother's film society <laughs> <at> college, <laughs> and uh, he dragged me to see it, and I just, I, and I, I was just in, intoxicated uh, by the experience. 
Bryce, yes. you we knew you knew he was a great singer. When did you come into the process? Um, you know, I, like like a lot of things, I, I got a call saying, "Hey, there's an audition for a piece." So you actually had a genuine audition. Oh, it yes. wasn't a meeting cloaked as. Oh yes. Now, uh, Darko, you have to you have to cast uh, someone like Bryce, impossibly handsome, in the role, right? Because the audience has to has to really like the murderer. They have to like the murderer. He has to be convincing as, uh, you know, the apex of this love triangle with two women, mm -hmm. you know. And it was really interesting because some people, producers, potential producers, had real problems, not with the fact that he kills eight people, but the <laughs> fact that there's an... They kill a lot more. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but that there's an implication of a three-way. Oh, and I was like, that is American morality. I was like, he killed eight relatives. You have no problems with it, yeah. but you think we should get rid of a three-way? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, Jefferson, how do you now distinguish each of the relatives? And and they're not the the relatives aren't the the, the greatest people in the world. I mean, no, they're, they're all about spoiled. Yeah, they're spoiled, yes, rich, narcissistic. Kids who nothing in their in yeah. their lives in their lives. So. Certainly. But you can you give us a sense of do you research like the background or do you imagine what this one would be like? And yes, I, I do. I, I I must confess that when I I did my first workshop and I uh, was confronted by. Uh, the problem of populating the stage with all these different people, um, I, I, I used just whatever popped into my head at the time. And I also, I'm a bit of a hat fetishist at mm. home, and so I brought in my hat collection. Oh, that's good. And uh, so I said, oh, I have a Boer War era Sola Topi for uh, Major <laughs> Lord Bartholomew. I asked if he could be a military man, and they right. changed it, and, uh, and a top hat, and a boater for the uh, sexually predatory Asquith Jr. So it was sort of the hat <laughs> determined the character. I yeah. worked from the outside out. Did yeah. you have any idea of the hats? That was what just what the actor brought to the... Uh... He brought them, but there were other things that happened in workshops, and so <laughs> the set was later built to preserve the routines Mm -hmm. that Jefferson Which came up with. You know, there's a guy who falls off the tower. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, I could build the tower. Yeah. But I was like, what's going to be funnier than this dopey routine, you know, that the two of them do? Mm -hmm. So that was the idea, you know, behind the projections and the, right. the Hitchcock vertigo spirals. You, you I wanted to preserve, I wanted to preserve the We made it guys. stupid and he made it beautiful. <laughs> well, but later, I'm sorry. So you guys, are, you guys are hamming it up in the <laughs> rehearsal, uh, rehearsal mm -hmm. hall, just sort of goofing around and uh, 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 doing physical comedy shtick and that kind of uh, Yes, stuff. and all the things that seemed like a really good idea at the time in rehearsal, but are yeah. actually quite painful now. I, know. <laughs> 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 really, I, I wish I could go back in time and find something a little less. Say, what you said about the hats is interesting, because uh, Laurence Olivier famously said uh, when he was developing characters, mm -hmm. find the shoes Yes. Found the man. Mm -hmm. But you right, work absolutely. from the top down. You I work from the... It's a different way of working. Jefferson, you're basically on a marathon. I mean, you're, you're, you are going all, on and off stage with just such incredible energy. And, and one wonders even if you have time to differentiate the characters beyond the hats. You're, you're, you're asked to switch around so quickly. It, it does happen at lightning speeds. And I... I um, you ever mix them up and come out with the wrong I, hat? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I've come out with costume pieces from other <laughs> vestigial costume pieces. And it's gotten... I mean, I've had to tear them off in the course of the performance and hurl them into the wings, which has gotten a laugh. Yeah, you I, mentioned your dresser before. Is it yes, one dresser well, or uh, more? How many? Good God, I have up to four people yeah, I mean, working on me yeah. at some points. But, but Julian... Um, Andres Arango is my dresser, and right. he's like an actor whisperer, the calmest man I've ever <laughs> met. He's completely zen, does lots of Bikram yoga, and he has a series of hand gestures. You know, he says, you know, stop, you know, sit, oh. essentially. I feel like a Westminster Airedale or something. <laughs> um, but he's, he's, he's a genius and keeps me calm, yeah. and then uh, and it, it affects these marvelous changes. Since this show is watched by a lot of aspiring um, actors and directors, I'd love just to get a sense of your background and what attracted you to the theater. We'll start with you, Bryce. Um, you grew up well, where? Yeah, I grew up in, uh, in Northern California, outside mm -hmm. of San Francisco. And uh, I always tell people that I, I think I had the... Uh, uh, my first grade teacher told my parents that they should probably find an outlet for my reckless creativity. <laughs> um, which they did, and that was, you know... Pulling that girl's hairs in front of exactly, you. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I, I sort of had the bug at an early age, but never took it seriously until college, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, found myself at the, the Yale School of Drama, moved to New York, and, um, you know, musicals has been uh, uh, where I've got my foot in the door. Now, Jefferson, you're a, a, a theatrical personality, on stage and off. Were you always theatrical when you were a kid growing up? Well, perhaps I was. I, I didn't, I, I, I lived in a neighborhood devoid of other children. So uh, <laughs> I come home from school and essentially put on last year's Halloween costume and and stagger around the yard mumbling to myself. Why were there no, <laughs> why were there no children in the yard? You'd killed them all? I like killed them all. <laughs>
No, it was just a neighborhood. There were no, no kids. So you had to entertain yourself. Yes, I did. Imaginary. So hence the one man shows. Yeah. <laughs> I think my first theatrical. We were talking about this the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, was being read aloud to by my parents. Ah. Uh, our television fell off the table sometime during the Vietnam War. <laughs> uh, Bass and Hound ran under and got caught in the cord. <laughs> and uh, and so my parents started to pass a novel around the table after dinner, like Great Expectations or David Copperfield or stories of James Thurber. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I loved that. My mother's face would change into whatever character she was reading. Oh, and it was magical and kind of creepy. And it really uh, excited me. And, uh, and my dad had a very lovely, detached narrative voice. So I think uh, that's theater in its purest form, a story. A performer and an audience, and uh, so being read aloud to as a child was, I think, the seminal. Now, Darko, you grew up in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah. Yeah, and in Belgrade. And uh, when I was seven, I saw the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, huh? um, and I asked my family about it. And then I staged the Olympics on the street with all the kids. There were kids in my neighborhood. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do anything to them, but I did rig it. So you did your own opening ceremony? Yes, I did, uh, wow. and, and I rigged it, you know, so that I would win the most gold medals. <laughs> and Very like Eastern European. Long distance yeah. spitting, and so, the that was, <laughs> so that was my first epic show. So you, you, so you were bitten early with this whole yeah, notion of, yeah. but not to, not to perform, to, or to be the impresario? Well, well, I did other things, but always directing was in mind. I literally knew what I wanted to do when I was seven, and I think it must be tough for people who don't know what they want to do with their lives. I don't know what that is. Because um, you know, plays. You're looking at it. <laughs> no. Yes, he's a he's a lost, lost. soul. No, I, I doubt it. it. Dar Dar I don't doubt it. You told me uh, in the green room that you uh, that both um, of your actors are very good technical actors, and that this was something that was very important to you. And you also well, told I me spend, you used to be a puppeteer. I spent five years on the road as a puppeteer, yes. mm -hmm. and I remember people sobbing, but. I didn't feel anything, but people in the audience are crying. So it's technique. You're yeah. just breaking down the movement. So I do gravitate towards actors who are technically very, very proficient. That's what changed my life, because if you can not feel so much and break things down technically, but people are sobbing in mm -hmm. the audience, then... Did you guys realize still... you were Darko's puppets? <laughs> I had no idea. Oh, no. no. Tamor over here. Exactly. Sorry, <laughs> oh, my God. The, you the marionettes. That's yeah. going cha to gonna change tonight's performance. It is. <laughs> Jerry <laughs> Anderson's puppets. Thunderbirds are gold. <laughs> in this musical, you are knocking off people who get in your way, which, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I have to say that I am really wishing I could knock off people who, 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 are, who are getting in my way. Mm -hmm. How do you go about it? Yeah, excuse me. What I hear you saying, <laughs> <laughs> what I hear you saying is sometimes you feel like the underdog, like yes. maybe there's somebody That's right. at, at your workplace, That's for right. example, who's, That's right. who's just sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, looking down at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you asked that. I, I, I actually brought a few things that think might be helpful, um, you know, moving forward for you if you think um, you, you might want to use Did them. You? The things that work for me uh, eight times a night. And uh, um, uh, anyway, I'll share them with you. The first I am uh, leaving. is, is <laughs> leaving right now. <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, oh, there you go. Yes. This is a, it, it, careful, it's heavy now. Um, <laughs> that can be used in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, very sharp. Uh, can really uh, mm. split things. It can also remove things from other things. I, I'll let Here's you know. Susie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Susie. Um, it's been cold in New York. Uh, oh, that's nice. Find yourself <laughs> out on the ice, you know, uh, in between shows. Uh, yeah, this can be found. Oh, 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 uh, or behind somebody handy. who's skiing. Yes, yes, exactly. It can be very... Right. Uh, right. You can saw off a leg on that one, Susan. Indeed. And finally, uh, you know, for a more subtle approach, um, oh, now a, a little poison in your pocket can really go a long way. Now, so. <laughs> That's right. Okay. <laughs> Armed with okay. these. Oh, and Michael, these. some more coffee? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I like that. So these are the real props that you use. Did you oh, any hats, I, Jefferson? I, no, I came hatless. Mm. Came hatless. So. All right, well, uh, <laughs> uh, don't miss A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder at the Walter Kerr Theater. Uh, terrific new musical based on the wonderful old rank movie, Kind Hearts and Coronet, starring a Bryce Pinkham as the murderer and Jefferson Mays as all of the victims, and directed by Darko... Treznjak? Treznjak, that's it. The puppets Mix. and the puppets. <laughs> and the put that axe. axe. Put that axe down, Susan. Put that axe down. We'll see you next time if I'm still around on Theater Talk. <laughs>
I am the next Earl of Pyehurst. And the last one you On March 16th, New York celebrated the 44th anniversary of the new Federal Theater, one of the first and most prominent black theaters in America. We are very pleased to have with us tonight the founder and artistic director of the new Federal Theater, Woody King, Jr. Thank you. Welcome to Theater Talk. Woody, in the last 40 years, how has black theater changed? Well, uh, the introduction of new writers who explored new kind of things, the introduction of George C. Wolfe, the introduction of um, people like Antizaki Shange and August Wilson, who uh, really explored the human condition in its totality. It was like amazing to see his 10 plays chronicling the uh, history of uh, African Americans in this country. Wilson, yeah. And so I was able to uh, produce one of his plays at New Federal, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Yeah, great, great and play. It was just amazing. So back in 1970, what gave you the motivation to start the New Federal Theater? Well, what happened, uh, again, I was uh, doing plays off-Broadway with the Chelsea Theater Center mm -hmm. and uh, with uh, the American Plays Theater. And uh, what happened is the advent of the Negro Ensemble Company mm -hmm. and the advent of the new Lafayette Theater, I had all these plays and I would go to them and ask the producing director of the theaters, please, please read this. And I said, no, no, no. And then one director says, look, if you want, want this play done, why don't you produce it yourself? <laughs> and uh, of course, I said, oh, this is an opportunity. I was at a location that had a beautiful theater, uh, the old neighborhood playhouse. I was working at Henry Street Settlement. And uh, uh, the then director, Bertram Beck, says, oh, you want to start a theater? Why not? <laughs> and we went around and raised the money, and Henry Street supported the theater for the next 20 years. You had been an actor, I know that. Yes. Had you had, you had your eye on producing, or was this something that just sort of took you well, over? <clears throat> well, again, uh, when I was very young, I arrived in New York uh, in 1964. So to make a long story short, I arrived in New York in a play that I had produced and directed, and I was starring in. And it's a three-character play. Hey, you were by, like the old actor manager. You, yeah, know, right, you right, ran right, everything. Right. <laughs> written by the Reverend Malcolm Boyd, mm -hmm. who was known as the civil rights minister. So all of his royalties and all of the prophets went back to the Episcopal Church and the sit-ins and the marches. So as a producer-director of the play, uh, Malcolm did not take a salary. And we gave it into the civil rights movement so I came into New York in a hit play. And uh, to make a long story short, I took a job as I was an engineer. Mm -hmm. And they found out I was an actor and fired me immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how. Uh, By necessity, uh, you yeah, had to yeah. make so, your way to the theater. You know, we was joined to play in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we built the theater inside. And one day, Ralph says, uh, Look, uh, we're going to be looking at some other writers. And one of the writers was Sam Shepard, and he was awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's how that theater started. And so we went over to uh, Henry Street and started our own. I'm curious, we have great um, uh, black actors and great black playwrights, but there have been very few black producers. Well, Why do you think that is? Well, I think... Uh, uh, African-American uh, producers got to be willing to ask for investments. Uh, they got to know how to really go after federal, city, state money <clears throat> and go after contributors, donors, and sponsors. And a lot of us really hate asking for it because we had turned down so many times. Mm. And uh, when Hanman told me something one time, he says, you got to be able to take rejections as a producer just as you take rejections as an actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was, you know, in the, in the 70s, you could produce a play off Broadway for $70,000. Right. So I had that group of people I could go to to put up a couple thousand dollars. 
But when it jumped to three, four, five hundred thousand, those people were not earning the kind of money that could make larger, larger investments. Right. So that's why the nonprofit New Federal Theater grew so rapidly. That's interesting. Because I knew Ashton Springer, who was uh, uh, the only African-American commercial producer that right. I knew for a long time working working on Broadway. Right, right, right. We have Stephen Bird now, by the way, who's done some very interesting things with James Earl Jones and the Tennessee Williams Estate. I don't know if you know Stephen at all. Yeah, I know Stephen, yeah. Yeah, but he works in the commercial theater, too. The commercial theater. <laughs> Were you ever tempted to go over to the commercial no, no, theater? No, no, It's not your... No. It has to be uh, non-commercial production that get great reviews, Right. And we show those to investors, and then they say, oh, it's got a great review, so we will move it. And that was my relationship with Joseph Papp, my relationship you with You produced for colored girls yes. who've committed suicide. No, for colored girls who've considered suicide. Suicide when, when the, the rainbow is enough. But she introduced George Wolf to us. So. What, was, what was little George C. Wolf like when he first came to you with the play? Well, he came to me with the Colored Museum. Colored Museum. Colored Museum. Right, right. From Crossroads. Right. And it, uh, uh, before that, he had a play with something like... Uh, I think he did with uh, Playwrights Horizon. They had something like 20 characters in it. <laughs> and because I could not uh, get the money and do it immediately because New Federal, never ha we never really have the money at that point. We can't say, oh, I'll do it right now. Mm -hmm. We got to say, oh, I love it. Now we go and raise the money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay. And George was impatient. <laughs> he still is. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so he went to uh, uh, Joe Papp. Right. Uh, and they brought it in from Crossroads, and uh, the rest is history. But I want to go back to For Colored Girls. Okay, okay. Um, d Did you cast that production? Were you, wh wh how far into, into the realization of that production were you working with it? No, no, I saw it at a cafe on East 3rd Street. Yes. Because two of the actresses in it at that time uh, invited me over. Yes. I went to see it, committed to doing it, and went to Joe Papp, and he said, well, if you do it and it works, uh, we can bring it over to the public. And it worked tremendously. Great reviews from Harold Clurman and yeah. Edith Oliver, just great reviews. And then we moved it over to the public. And uh, I guess three or four weeks into the rehearsal, re-rehearsing at the public, Joe felt that he wanted to bring in some stars. And we would walk around the block talking about what he wanted to do and he was going to do it, and you couldn't say no to him. You just listen, <laughs> be very quiet. But he never brought in uh, Rosalind Cash, Gloria Foster, Ellen Holly. These were they the were actresses them. he wanted to bring in. And uh, the play opened, got great reviews, and it was like that conversation never happened. And, and he had the, you had the wonderful actress, Trezana Beverly, Trezana Beverly, who yes. won the Tony Award. Won the One of the most wonderful performances I have ever seen, Trezana Beverly. She teaches at New Federal Theater Acting, and she came to our 44th anniversary um, a celebration on April 16th. Well, how much money did you have when you started the New Federal Theater? What was the original uh, seed money for it? Uh, about uh, $225,000. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to give up my job at the Rockefeller Foundation to get 75 of that. Because okay. they didn't want it to be a conflict of interest. Could you give one piece of advice for young producers before we go? Starting, you know, one starting their theater, oh, starting yeah. a theater company. What, what, what would you tell young Because the theater really only thrives when you have people who are your age now starting uh -huh. their dreams and their hopes and their, their theater. Well, I think uh, I was very much aware of uh, the contributions of the literary establishment, especially African-American literary establishment. And I would say to the young people, if you're not passionate about what you want to produce, don't try and produce it. You can't ask anyone to invest or even get a grant unless you are passionate. I'm going to do this play. I've got to do this play, and it is the most important play uh, but, you know, now it's more uh, you'll find young producers really throwing a lot of stuff against the wall and hoping something stick. And I don't think yeah. that's the way to do it. Or let's find another movie. You know, right, right. And we can do a musical. <laughs> yeah, we'll just churn as many things out as we can. If one's a hit, then it pays for the others. Right, right. But you, you devoted resources and your, your life. emotional well-being probably to a couple of shows over the years. Right, right. you got to believe in it. And uh, uh, the theater... And uh, my life are so inextricably bound. Yeah. It's like it's really one. You know, if I go to the theater, uh, 
to see a raised in the sun is to talk to Denzel about something else. You know? And he started with you, right? Denzel yes, started yeah, with yes, you, yeah. yeah. Denzel supported the theater for the last, since he's been a star. Yeah, yeah. Sam Jackson supports the theater since he's been a star. Yeah. Morgan Freeman, his foundation always gives us funding. Happy anniversary, Happy 44 years and counting. Just 44 Wouldn't more. Thank you very much for coming to Theater Talk, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I'm, right. I'm sorry we didn't get the thing in about Ed Bullins, but I hope we will well, we'll, come back. Oh, well, you could say, yeah. We're going to open Ed Bullins' play called The Fabulous Miss Marie, mm. April 17th at Castillo Theater, and it stars Tanya Pinkins, <gasps> oh, she's who's a fantastic artist as The Fabulous Miss Marie, and co-stars Roscoe Orman from Sesame Street. Very good. Thank you. See you next time on Theater Talk. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.